Welcome to this video about My Origins 3. I'm Paul Mayer. I'm the population geneticist at Family Tree DNA. Today I'd like to give you a breakdown of the methods of My Origins, including how we discovered population structure in the first place and how we selected reference populations to estimate your ancestry. This is the second video I'm doing in a series on My Origins, so if you haven't watched it yet, make sure you watch the first video and then come back. So you've seen in the first video that we're an incredibly diverse species. We've seen that our history is very complex from hundreds of thousands of years of mixing and isolation and then more mixing. And you know that my origins has a staggering 90 reference populations, the most that's currently available for any major percentage test. You've seen that your result comes with a chromosome painting. Percentages and chromosome paintings are actually two different types of ancestry analysis. So in a few minutes, I'll explain how we combine the two. But first, how do we come up with our populations in the first place? I think it's important to define the word population. We're of course using the word in a genetic sense, which might be confusing because it has many different colloquial definitions. Genetically, and this is not unique to human beings, there are two important components. A population must be cohesive within, and it must be distinct from other such populations. To be a little more technical, that means it must be a panmictic group of individuals, and it must have sufficiently low gene flow from other such populations. So in the cartoon at the bottom, you can see the two opposite ends of this spectrum. At the left, there are three distinct groups of people who are genetically isolated, and at the right, there's so much gene flow that they all comprise one population. Let's visualize this to make it crystal clear. Panmixia means every person is equally likely to interbreed with every other person in that group. It's basically random mating with no major preference or bias. Think of this as the drunk college party metaphor for populations. Obviously, no human groups are exactly like this in a certain generation, but the point is, over many generations, many groups behave like this on average, and some groups more than others. The other requirement is less than one migrant per generation between groups. Again, what matters is the average pattern over hundreds or thousands of years. With just one migrant moving between groups every generation, the distinct genetic profile of each population is erased. So then, what are we trying to avoid? Well, a group like this, where individuals only marry their next door neighbors instead of mating randomly. Or a group like this with massive gene flow. We choose references using a combination of tools, for example, principal components analysis, or PCA. Here you see an unedited genetic structure of all European countries in a single plot. This is really, really messy, and there are really no discernible boundaries between countries. So in order to find predictable genetic populations, we need to weed down the samples based on certain criteria. For example, we only use unrelated individuals, all four grandparents must be verified to be from the same population. And then we only ultimately keep populations that can be consistently and accurately separated using genetic classification tools. Take a look at how clean this PCA plot is compared to the last one. It's also important to note that populations exist in hierarchies. That's because most modern groups derive their ancestry from more ancient parent groups. Here you see all 90 of our reference populations and they're analyzed using a genotype clustering tool. We can force there to be a certain number of parent groups, for example, two at the top there, and then three, four, all the way down to 10. When you get to 10, you see basically continental structure. There's two groups in Africa, African foragers and Sub-Saharan Africans. Then there's North Africa and the Caucasus in the Middle East. There's Europe, South Asia, Siberia, the Americas, East Asia, and finally the Sahul region, including Australia and Papua New Guinea. This hierarchical structure is really important for my origins three, as you'll see in a second. We organize our 90 pops into 34 superpopulations or parent groups. So for example, here we have three super pops. We have Myanmar, Philippines indigenous, and Northeast Asia. Inside each super pop are one or more populations. For example, in Philippines indigenous, you have Austronesian and Melanesian. In Northeast Asia, you have Korean, Japanese, and North Han Chinese, and Myanmar is its own singular superpop. We can represent all of our 34 superpopulations as a sort of phylogeny, but there's a major caveat here. 
No phylogeny can really represent human history since phylogenies are, by definition, simple bifurcating trees. Human history is much more complicated due to all the ancestral mixing. So this tree is only an approximation of how groups fit into other groups, and it's really for classification purposes. But it is helpful to see how all of our 90 populations fit into this higher structure. Now that you have a taste of human population structure and how we choose our reference populations, Let's dive into the purpose and the goals of My Origins 3. There's a trade-off between accuracy and the number of populations, or specificity. If you include more POPs, then each population has more genetic overlap with, gene with uh, neighboring populations, which lowers the accuracy. Also, to include a chromosome painting, there's another trade-off. Predicting the ancestry of each small DNA segment is called local ancestry inference. It requires that small DNA segments are actually distinct enough to identify which population they came from. If they're not very distinct, then the chromosome painting will lower the accuracy and the specificity. So our goal was to find that sweet spot in the middle, the compromise. Let's illustrate the challenge of the chromosome painting with a cartoon. So here you have three different groups. If they are on different continents, they're probably isolated and well-defined populations. Ethnic groups on a single subcontinent have more overlap more panmixia, and as we saw before, might not be separate populations. But here's the problem for a chromosome painting. The segments of DNA that are unique are few and far between. Those are shown in color, in the red, blue, and yellow. Many segments of DNA remain similar, shown in gray. Geneticists call these shared ancestral polymorphic segments. Even for people separated by continents and thousands of years, there are many segments of DNA that don't change much at all. DNA divergence happens very slowly in little islands on each chromosome. We can simulate this. Take three real groups of people, Russians, British people, and Iberian people. If we capture those islands of DNA that are informative about ancestry, we can separate them easily. 300,000 SNPs is plenty. You can see that they're easily separated. But with only 3,000 SNPs, there are few differences. And with 300 SNPs, or about half a centimorgan, they might as well be the same population. Therefore, in My Origins 3, we only do a chromosome painting for groups of people who are quite distinct. We only paint your chromosomes at the superpopulation level, so we don't sacrifice accuracy. The pipeline looks like this. We estimate your percentages with a global ancestry inference tool, meaning we use all of your genetic markers, regardless of which chromosomes they came from, and that allows us to accurately predict your percentages from 90 different populations. Then we estimate your chromosome painting with local ancestry inference using the 34 superpopulations. Finally, we integrate the two into a final estimate and display your results. Integrating these two methods it's not only a completely novel method, but we find it actually increases overall accuracy, as you'll see in a minute. For example, here's a hypothetical family tree. Let's imagine that this is your four grandparents, two parents, and you. We're keeping only chromosome one here for simplicity, but keep in mind that the chromosome painting includes all 22 autosomes, everything but your X, Y if you're a male, and your mitochondrial DNA. Due to random genetic recombination, Let's say you inherit 13% purple ancestry from your dad's dad. Purple in this case is a superpopulation. Then your percentages might be broken down further into say 10 and 3% at the population level. Here's a more concrete example. A hypothetical person has three Ashkenazi Jewish grandparents. In this case, the fourth grandparent is half British and half Irish. The chromosome painting shows only two colors, Ashkenazi and West Europe, but the percentages break that down further into British and Irish. Again, this is how we include a chromosome painting without sacrificing any accuracy or population specificity. And the pipeline works quite well. Overall, populations are assigned with a mean accuracy of 89%, and superpopulations are assigned with a mean accuracy of 96% you can see how most of the bars are on the right side of each plot, which is good. You can see our accuracy even better in this confusion matrix plot. If samples are assigned to their correct group, they're shown black on the diagonal. If they're misassigned, they're shown in red off the diagonal. 
again, 96% accuracy at the level of superpopulations. In many cases, accuracy of My Origins 3 is about 10% better than My Origins 2, the previous version, and nearly 30% better in one case. So that's it for the methods breakdown. Thanks for watching this video, and remember this is part two in a series I'm doing on My Origins. In the next video, I'd like to cover more about population history and why it's complex, and in some cases might give you a result that you weren't expecting. So for now, I hope you enjoyed the video. Stay curious, and thanks for watching.